Hello and welcome, everybody, to the Josh Christopher stream. Um, thank you to Kumio Fioso and Sawyer for subscribing. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I want to say thank you especially to our guest, uh, rising star in the industry. Um, uh, the only person that I know who's ever written a cover story for anything. Um, so I guess by that definition, he's the most successful person I know. Um, welcome, uh, Jackson Frank. Thank you. Uh, that's a, that's some serious pressure for me to deliver on this on this stream now. The most famous person you've ever had on on here that you know. I'll do my I'll do my best to help break down uh, Josh Christopher's game this evening. Yeah. No, just don't tell Nikias I said that. Uh, <laughs> you know, I can't I can't let the AVO mafia come after me. Um, <laughs> thank you to you Spell for subscribing. Um, so, what was your experience with Josh Christopher before? Uh, before this? Um, so I watched, you know, I haven't done as much draft work this year, of course, um, you know, just with focusing more on the NBA itself, but I watched a few games at the start of the season. Um, and a little, I knew a little bit about him as a, as a prospect, you know, pre-college. Obviously, he was pretty highly marketed or well-marketed by, you know, an array of, of places, notably Slam Magazine and whatnot. Um, but my, my understanding of him was he... He had some very enticing physical traits, um, you know, good frame. Uh, there was a decent shot. He, you know, decent chance he could he could shoot, um, but he he had some limitations with his his approach to scoring and playmaking. Um, so kind of I guess kind of the prototypical like good athlete with an interesting scoring package, but some serious concerns about process and also some underrated physical limitations. Is kind of my general outline of him and then kind of what I saw um, in the few games that I watched, you know, back in the fall. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's, he's somebody who's definitely been on my radar uh, for a couple of years. Um, played his senior year of high school with, with Dior, um, who's now committed to Oregon. Um, and um, I think the thing with, with Josh for me was always like what translates. Um, I never doubted he was going to produce, but like his archetype is one that, that production, um, doesn't always like his archetype and its translation from production um, is always, you know, a, a difficult one. So let's jump over to the film slide. There's our guest. There is Jackson Frank, the one and, the one and only. Um, so here are the things that, that I would like to talk about. Um, the first one is, is shot mechanics. Um, Christopher has uh, mediocre shooting numbers, but um, there's clear low hanging fruit on how, how he shoots and, and how he shoots offers some limitations. Um, in terms of uh, you know directionality and, uh, and and off the dribble combinations, um, the second one is two foot finishing craft. Uh, there is uh, a bias towards one foot finishers; it just looks better. Uh, the Shea Gilgis Alexanders of the world and, and their ability to slither to the rim, um, but uh, two foot finishing like really does work and, and does require a different set of craft, a different craft set of type of setup, um, and and that's something that you know with his body type ability to just go around his way is important it is jumped out to me uh the third thing is, is finding momentum so um christopher plays in a pretty like a a sort of horizontal role he's usually coming off negative momentum he's not put in in what i would call like jet sweep actions where you just you, you get an athlete in space and you're always asking difficult questions of defense he had a little bit more of an organizing role and i think for him in the league um especially as the, as the jumper is developing finding areas where he can attack downhill, finding uh, you know, lateral spaces in a defense is going to be important and something that I'm looking for on film. Um, the last or the, the next one is defensive archetype. Um, I don't know if you had either a, a prior idea or something that jumped out to you the film. Like what do you see him as defensive? Yeah, that was that was probably the the biggest thing I, I struggled with. Like going back through some notes of, you know, back in you know a few months ago and then even watching this this game we're gonna break down, I struggled to get a great grasp of his defense. Like, you know, the offense, I feel pretty confident because I had some priors and, and I also thought it was a pretty like good reflection of his strengths and weaknesses, uh, in this singular game. Um, but the defense, it, it was tough. The, I think he's a guy who you, you want to put on poor decision. You want to put on a lesser offensive player and poor decision makers because he can, kind of overwhelmed with his strength and size. Uh, it has pretty good anticipation, you know, in terms of, you know, getting his hands in the pass lens. I think he measured with a six 
just over six nine wingspan at the combine this week, um, which is pretty dang good given his shooting guard's you know height. Um, so he's someone you kind of want to when the ball swings his to his assignment, he can do things to overwhelm them. And I think he's oh I think he's okay in certain off ball sequences. Um, like he had a play in this game that'll break down where he's pretty well positioned. I don't know if we'll break that play down, but it's he had one where nothing came up, but he was well positioned to the nail, um, was able to recover back to his shooter on the wing or his man on the wing. Um, so I view him as a guy who on the ball, you know, you want him on a lesser player um, because he has some interest, some pretty intriguing physical tools that he can use to his advantage. Um, but off the ball, I struggled a little bit to get a great grasp of it. Um, but just generally, I think he is, he does some things well. I know you, I know you broke, to, you, you included a couple of clips that we'll go through. Um, and I'm curious to kind of see how you feel about them, because I think one thing I'm still trying to really improve with my analysis is certain decision-making things on defense um, in terms of, you know, playing off the ball and whatnot. So I'm curious to see how we approach those, but that's generally how I view him defensively, maybe kind of a non-answer, but just the thing no, that's to that. I think me. that is a real answer. And I think that, um, one of the things that the internet has really uh, encouraged in, in basketball writing is not like being transparent with your process and being like, Hey, so I, this guy is kind of between a couple of things because like, that's how basketball development works. Sometimes you're between a couple of areas and, and a player doesn't have enough on tape to decree what they are, but the internet wants firm, strong opinions that can be written in, in, you know, capital letters. Um, for me, I, I do think that, that you're right that I would want him overwhelming defenders, like maybe lesser ball handlers. Like he, He's very instinctive, and I think his instincts are, are mostly correct, but they're mostly correct when he's making decisions downhill as a defender, when he has his ears been back and he's he's hunting a ball handler's handle or or he he's made the decision that like this ball hand, or you know the ball's gonna get swung and they're going to go towards the rim, so I'm gonna meet them at the rim. When he's making mm-hmm. decisive athletic decisions in big space, he's a he's a terror. Mm-hmm. When he's sort of stuck in mud and has to choose between a number of options, that's where it can get like the angles can get a little sloppy and while he does have good tools, they're not like they're more strength based and they're more at, at like a point of attack and he can get lost like navigating big space occasionally, which is a, an archetype that is between things. Um, and the last one is, is sort of the I think of all the things that I've talked about this year, like a hobby horse that I've found is is advantage creation and advantage care. So like advantage is really hard to get in the NBA. I wrote a, a profile on, uh, uh, on Mr. Cal Bridges. And uh, maybe one of the, the testimonials for how quick advantage can disappear in the league. And when you have people like that who can just wipe away, you know, wipe away any sort of advantage, you have to really cherish the advantage you do create. And even if it's a sliver, you either have to continue it or try to make a decision that causes another rotation. And the balance for Christopher specifically is interesting to me because I think that he can create advantage. And I think that he does make good decisions but it's not always optimized where he's thinking with the mindset of like, am I making a play or am I trying to force the defense to continue to be in rotation? And that's, that's like, I think more than shot selection, I think more than shot mechanics. This is the thing I find most essential for his offensive archetype. Cause like, he's going to be able to do certain things. The question is like, how is his mentality about the advantage he creates and the advantage that's created for him? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, what stand out to me, I think that, I mean, advantage creation has really kind of entered the lexicon the last couple of years or maybe the last year, but I think advantage care is a really interesting add on to that. And it's something that does really apply to Christopher in my, you know, view of him. I, I think at times he, well, and there'll be clips that we can certainly reference specifically, but I think at times he has a tendency to want to do things on his terms with the ball in his hands. And sometimes that limit that kind of negates an advantage that's been created for him. Um, but sometimes it can work because as he mentioned, you know, the physical tools are, he has, does have some pretty f- interesting physical tools, but um, I definitely agree there that kind of, it's an, it's a balance in a developmental area that really does seem crucial to what he can do. Yeah. Um, and with that, let's get into this uh, Arizona state Stanford game. Um, so here would be an example of advantage creation. So here he has got five people in the, like he has created an advantage and he has now got the defense to basically give all of their attention towards it. Mm-hmm. And instead of like making them make a decision, he kicks it out. Of you. Um, and this is sort of, uh, I would say an emblematic of, of his decision-making process where rather than like holding that moment in tension, being like, okay, what are you going to do? He tries to dictate the terms of like, okay, now it's a kick out rather than sitting there and, and allowing the defense to make a mistake. Like right there, he just waits a second. It, it could be a floater. It could be you know a kick out. He, he doesn't, oh, he predetermines his process a little bit 
Um, mm-hmm. And for two foot jumpers, I find that really interesting because like there are a lot of guys who sort of have his his approach, and a lot of them have this particular floater is that they kind of sit usually on a stride stop, which we'll talk about a little bit later, where they they get to a pocket, they see if the big will step up, you know, looking for a dish. If they don't step up enough, it's just a big little baby float. Um, and you have Karis who who has this particular move, and Jimmy is also the same. Here we get Jimmy in a pick and roll in the middle, pro hop, big doesn't step up enough for the dump off, baby float. And it's that it's that hop step that stalls long enough to say, okay, big, what are you gonna do? Defense, what are you gonna do? If they don't react, if they sit in there, if they sit or if they help back over, then you have an option. And I just wanted to see that process a little bit uh, more clear. And I think that's something that, that's a pretty easy improvement. Um, here we're gonna get uh, uh, a, like a DHO. This this is a pretty continuous play for him. You get him on these like little DHOs. And mm-hmm. it's there's just not enough. Like he he catches it, the defense is set, and they're you know uh, the point of attack is is determining a direction, and behind him is is perfectly set, and he just shoots. Um, I think that like this isn't the clip that we'll we'll talk about his shooting, but like this to me is is the process of like okay let's see what works rather than um, rather than like like the defense didn't have to make any adjustments to his process. His process just existed and it worked for him. Yeah, I think in on that that first play you showed where he try he came around the dribble handoff on the right side, what stood out to me when you contrast it with the Karis clip and the Jimmy clip is the cadence. Um, you know, Karis and Jimmy aren't the same, but there's a certain level of control they're wielding over the defense on those plays that allows them to get to that floater. Whereas with Christopher, it's kind of like, well, I'm going downhill. Here's the read that I I can make to the corner um, to Bagley or you know the big man in the dunker spot. And I'll try and do that all in one motion. Whereas Christopher has the frame to, you know, slow that down a little bit, you know, get the defender on his back, you know, put him in jail is kind of the term they use a lot. Um, and, and as you say, kind of force the defense to actually do something. Cause he's, he's one, right. He has step one down where, you know, he had 10 eyes looking at him, but he just kind of lets the possession develop rather than him developing the possession. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, it seemed like he wanted to make a certain read and he could have made it if he had better cadence over it but he was just so, I don't know if content is the right word, but he, he just let the play unfold, you know, as he went downhill rather than, you know, slowing a little bit and seeing what read was available. He just seemed, you know, it seemed like he had an idea in his head and that's, that's how it happened. Um, and those two other guys, you know, obviously they shot floaters, whereas Christopher made a pass. Um, there was just a stark contrast there in the cadence and the, you know, kind of the, how I interpret the the decision-making unfolding in each of those guys' heads. Yeah. I mean, the way that I, kind of think about it is dictating the terms like are you dictating the terms for the defense or are you letting the defense dictate the terms and at times it feels like the defense makes a decision he makes a counter decision rather than being like hey are you guys sure about that are you sure you don't want to help a little bit more that's a pretty good shooter over there and then you walk to a layup um mm-hmm. the other area that this shows up is is off ball so like on this dho play we'll see that he like he doesn't set up his man enough and like there's always options you can change your you know you can take a step towards the the screen then take a step back and then alter it I think that um, we're going to see him come off a lot of zipper actions, a lot of Iverson actions. And like when we watch Devin Booker here, like Devin Booker gets, gets top locked and moves the screen around to get what he wants. Like he really mm-hmm. takes time to, to adjust. He's like, okay, we were going to run the play this way. No way you're cheating. Okay. Let's go this way. Hey, move over here. I'm like, this is just the patience of being like, no, we'll figure it out. Like whatever coverage you have, I'm going to make you commit to that coverage. And then when you commit, then I'll make it. Decision. And that manipulation of the game, that patience and just being like, this is how it's going to be is I think the next step for Christopher and also like just the next step for guys of his archetype. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. I definitely agree. Oh, um, I was just gonna say, I think the, the optimism for Christopher in that regard in terms of, you know, dictating the terms is there, I think there are times where he tries to do that, but I don't think it's always the right time to do it. But I think that can be, that can be tweaked and, you know, applied in the proper setting and i think that's encouraging um like there are some plays throughout this game that i'm sure we'll, we'll get to where he maybe faultily tries to dictate the terms um but the very the very understanding to try at least try it i think is worthwhile and something that as you project development um is is encouraging um but it's a matter of you know i guess what's i guess directing it in the proper settings rather than kind of and I guess that's the way I would put it. And I think that's it. But I, but if I, you know, if I were to evaluate him, or I guess I am, but uh, as I evaluate him and project him, I would feel that would be a, a positive for me that he at least tries at times to dictate things, even if it's not 
the correct you know opportunity all the time. There's at least a baseline of the the understanding that that's an important trait as a as a decision maker offensively. Yeah, um, I think that Arizona State at times oversimplified things for him and, and didn't uh, that kind of corralled him into easier decisions. Like here, we're going to get a we for for first time viewers. Uh, dotted lines or passes, zigzags or triples, you know, lines or lines. Um, and like here, he, he's going to make this pass. But you can see he, he winds up a little bit too much. Like he's making this pass with two hands, and that means that he's throwing it from a higher spot. And like he has a functional handle, but he also like has some funky movement stuff and, and is not as efficient with how he gets the ball out of his handle, which like we will see with this jumper. Um, and at times, I just wanted their offense to give him a little bit more baseline possessions. Like this stuff is good to, you know, to get somebody a feel to, to run a little bit of weave just to get things going. But I just generally wanted to see more decision making, but more targeted decision making. Yeah, I agree. I mean that that place, I mean, just I mean, I again that was two minutes into the game or two and a half minutes into the game and I hadn't I haven't watched Christopher in depth in half a year and I was like, yeah, that's just a that's just a read in the offense. Like I mean I didn't really you know I didn't make note of it in terms of his actual skill. I made note of it in, in terms of how the 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 offense, you know, Utilized him, I guess. Yeah, the uh, the the two hand passing was the thing that jumped out to the most fair. So here is probably like I would say our our first like, well, what do you do here moment? So we're doubling the low post. Uh, I think that's Bagley is going to fight in front of the, the other post, and Christopher has two. So his responsibility is to read which way the double is pushing. You know, the ball handlers they're clearly trying to take away that baseline look, the baseline mm-hmm. skip, and his responsibility is just to be there for both options. This is sort of a no win, but the idea is that the pressure is going to make the pass a little bit higher arc, a little bit more difficult. And Christopher is just playing strong safety. Like technically you have both routes, but that cross court pass is a little harder and you're just hedging between both knowing that like both of these passes are fairly difficult. And if things should break down, you bet on the one that you find to be more dangerous. So that's what his responsibility is on something like this. Um, I, the execution is a little mixed. Um, he can't cover ground as well as I would hope. He's long, but his legs are a little bit short, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get these possessions where, like, he has the right idea. He's pretty well positioned, but he loses it towards the end. And, and when when you have two guys, you always have to stay at the midpoint between them. And mm-hmm. and as as right now, that pass is easier, so you have, that's your bigger concern. He gambles a little bit. Yeah, th- that is a play that I that I legitimately like when I was watching this game. I think it was yesterday or the day prior um, that I, I watched over this exact play like at least five or six times because I want it because this is the sort of thing where I, as I said earlier, like I'm still trying to nail down kind of the decision making defensively, and this is one where ultimately I settled on the same conclusion that that yes, that that skip is tougher because it has to go, you know, through at least two defenders as is. And also, I, I don't know exactly. That's De, that's Delore in the corner. Not Delore right in the corner. Yeah, I think so. Um, that's Spencer Jones up top. And you know, if I recall, Spencer Jones is a much better shooter. Um, and it's an easier pass. Like like here, I mean, even if like even if G- Christopher is at the at the elbow at the right elbow, um, you know, he can still maybe recover to an extent to get a close on the shooter. Where he is now, it's really tough. Like as you said, like I was also underwhelmed like on this recovery here. Yeah. Um, and which which is an, I this an interesting point you made about the legs, but that that stood out to me too. Is like in real time when it happened, I guess not in real time. The first time I watched it, I was I was a little surprised how long it took him to recover there. Um, but yeah, I think you know when it come when it come when push comes to shove, when you're splitting the difference there on the weak side, uh, it's got to be taking away the easier pass. And if the defense beats you on the worst pass or the tougher pass, so be it. But uh, yeah, that, I I watched that one a lot, and it stood out to me. And I ultimately concluded that. Um, not really an easy situation at all, um, but he probably made just a probably shifted a little too far down and, and kind of ended up costing his team, you know, a, an open look. Yeah. Um, I mean, it falls within the bounds of like what I would say is normal mistakes. Like mm-hmm. for me, like with with help side with like putting put into what are essentially like no win situations or like uh, elite only wins. Like if you if you're just like a truly awesome recovery guy. You can, you know, Devin Vassell might be able to get out of that, but I don't expect people to win. But it's understanding how they're just like what they're looking at, what they're seeing to me is is more valuable. I'm like, oh, that's a loss. Like I'm not a plus minus scout where it's like I, I've marked you know plays as positive or plays as negative. Um, for me, it's just like what situations if if he thinks this way, then what situations do you put him into to you know, make the the good things more clear and the bad things happen less. Um, so let's talk about the jump. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, sure. Josh is like, you know, a, a mid to low 30s um, as a shooter. 
his balance, um, it's fine when he starts. He, he flicks his legs out most of the time. Um, but he lands hard. That's a, that's a thing I noted. But the most meaningful thing about his jumper is he shoots from his left hip pocket. Um, so most people put the ball either in the center of their body or on their right hip pocket and bring it straight up or a little bit diagonal um, to, to their release point. Uh, Josh shoots from his left hip pocket basically to his left eye. Um, which causes a number of problems. So, like, as we'll see, um, I think we'll let one run before we freeze it. Um, this is from the combine. Um, as we can see, that's fully on the left side of his body, which causes his hand, instead of being under the ball, to be sideways. Because the hand is sideways, it causes the elbow to be out. If you basically, you know, everybody at home mimic the hand motion that he's trying to do, you'll see that your elbow is pointing way, you know, way out there. And that causes, you know, oh, I didn't, I didn't recenter this. Um, so, um, the issue is that like when your hand is diagonal, it can cause you to shoot with different fingers. So instead of, um, ideally you want to shoot with your longest finger which for most people, is their index finger. There are the occasional because the NBA is full of huge hands. There are the occasional people who the middle finger is the longest one. Generally it's bad to shoot with the, the three, which would, be your, which would be your ring finger and your pinky. Um, and, but that can happen because of with the way your hand is positioned. Sometimes your hand will slide and the last contact is with those two. And that is a worry on some of his misses that because his elbow, because of the, the gather point, which causes the hand motion, the hand motion causes the elbow, it can cause the finger to slide. You can see that he's put in work to try to eliminate thumbing on, on the middle season. The, I have a draft express clip uh, coming up soon. You can see that like, he's, he's, he's pushing that with his left hand. You, you can tell he's trying to, uh, to, to eliminate that, which is you know, generally positive if you have a lot of inputs to to eliminate that that extra but yeah. just contrasting that 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 clip from the stanford game versus that one uh, a pretty stark difference in terms of the, the left thumb interference on the on the jumper and i i feel like i mean i think i think jake rosen tweeted this but like the caveat always i'm not a shot doctor but no, i feel like just <laughs> of course i feel like the but logically speaking if you have two forces kind of working against each other there my i guess my point here is like the thumbing thing i i would view as like a, a, th a thing you should work to improve because logically speaking, if you have kind of forces working in different directions like that, uh, it makes it harder for the, you know, it makes the success, it hurts the success rate. Um, so that's how I kind of interpret that. Um, I'm sure there are, I know there are some very good shooters historically that thumb it. Um, but you could have, yeah, you can, I mean, just compare that to that combine club, you know, versus the, the late January one. Um, clearly there's an effort to get rid of that, that thumb interference in the left, the left hand. I mean, you can just, it's just a stark difference. And I'm sure you mentioned we'll have a slow, slow motion one for mid season. Uh, and you'll be able to tell a stark contrast between the, how much of a, a role his left thumb plays. So I've tried to, to fight that shot doctor or our shot surgeon idea. Um, and unsuccessfully people, you know, are probably going to say it until until you know the day I leave this mortal coil, I'm gonna settle for people saying I'm not a shot engineer because like the way that I generally like the way that I legitimately think about shooting is just like you're trying to simplify it as much as possible to make it repeatable. Mm -hmm. And so the more like funk you have in your jumper, the harder it is to repeat it because the forces just work against repetition. When there's a lot of like if you've ever run an equation, if you have thirty terms, like it, there's a lot that could go wrong. If you have like three terms and they don't move that much, like you're gonna have a higher chance of repetition. So to me, thumbing or no thumbing isn't a particular issue. It's that like if you're trying, if you have a slipping issue, the thumb does make the slipping more likely. Um, hmm. To me, the bigger issue is the gather point. Um, as you can see, it, uh, I pause this now, but like you can see that 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 right hand is is very diagonal, and he's working to get it underneath. But it's always going to be a clear and present danger as long as you're bringing the ball across your body that you will shoot with your pinky and your ring finger, just because of how physics work when you're gathering the ball. So that is, um, those are my concerns. Obviously, when you shoot from the left pocket, it makes shooting going to your right, as we've all seen with Lonzo, as we've seen with you know, cross-body shooters. There are just like inherent difficulties to having a, a really declarative shot pocket, um, as we are, are going to see with a guy who has a similar uh, arm motion, but not a similar gather motion. Like you, The arm is, itself is not a problem if you can guarantee that you shoot it. Because there are multiple NBA players that have that sort of like not as dramatic because they're not shooting from the left side, they're shooting from the center. Um, but they're still functional. And uh, and here is the uh, the midseason clip where you, like this is um, you can see how easily it would be for the ball to slip. Yeah. The other hands, we see the thumb on the on the left hand. 
there's just a lot of inputs. Now let's compare this to somebody like Kawhi. Kawhi shoots from the middle of his body, but he also has the jagged uh, right hand angle. But his hand is always under the ball. And like he does have the increased benefit of having like the world's largest hands, but he's always shooting off the same fingers. And that rep- that repetition of uh, of elements within a jumper is the most important part. Um, so when we when we are seeing him, I also tried to speed up the uh, the, the phantom cam footage. It looks very funny um, uh, for the second one. The first time through, it's it's the normal super slow. And I tried to speed it up on the second one. Like we can see the difference is like if you shoot from the middle of the body, and you're going to your right eye. It's you can do it. If you do it from your right pocket, it's straight up and down. If you do it from the left side, there's a lot more area to cover, but also it limits the amount you can do. So I will say that as long as you're shooting off the same finger, that jagged arm isn't necessarily bad. It's just that the other elements have to be rock solid. Again, limiting funk is the most important thing when it comes to shooting. And like I'm by no means a, a disciplinarian when it comes to, to shooting. If you can do it the same way every time, it's fine. Um, here we have some of the free throws. You'll see how far over it is on the left side. There's some lower body stuff. Also, shout out to the St. Vincent St. Mary's uh, pro models he has on. Um, it's an elite. He changes them at halftime in this game, though. He, yeah, he, uh... he, changes the, he changes them at halftime. I was hoping to pick one of the easy quantum games, but um, the, it, that one felt a little a little wonkier than this one did um, in terms of uh, you know getting getting the average game, getting the, the performance that covers everything. Um, so this is one of my favorite clips, I think, of anybody this cycle. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, this gets called a goaltend because you know college refs or whatever. But he hasn't left the floor yet. <laughs> yeah, that that was ridiculous. And I Thank watched you it. N four. Um, <laughs> yeah, he explodes off to. Um, yeah, it's uh, dramatic. We have a couple more of them in this game uh, where you can just see like that when he does load up, like oh boy, that like fun things can happen, and that's sort of where we talk about like the aggressive defense working out for him. Um, and that, like, the ability to convert big space into small space. Um, here we're going to get another down screen. Um, he's going to pick it up. And this is the advantage creation idea. So um, he, hit for one small moment, has a ton of advantage. He's coming off this, this sort of, like, zipper cut that gets flipped out, um, and he's catching the top of the key. The defense, since it takes him that quarter second to, to read and read a foot, it goes from being... Um, uh, it goes from being like partial advantage to none. And that's the idea of advantage care. Just being like, okay, so I know I'm coming off this action that, that can cause the defense to turn. And what we are seeing is that now he's going against a set defense and a set defense that has a direction for him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's interesting because there's a very similar play where later in the game that I'm sure will break down where it's, 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 it's similar because the defender has his hips opened up. There's a lane to the rim. It's a much more pronounced lane to the rim later. But um, but he takes advantage of any any attacks. Um, I can't recall exactly what happens, but um, he he capitalizes on it. But there, yeah, he he he's just a little. It kind of goes back to what I was saying, where he he tries to do things on his own terms rather than what maybe the, which is not a bad thing inherently. But sometimes you can do things on your own ter- terms while blending what the offense produces for you. And here, of course, it works out because sometimes Remy Martin hits ridiculous shots. Um, but I mean, there's a there's a lane right like right there. But like before, like if he would have ripped through upon the initial catch, mm-hmm. um, he would have been able to get downhill. And he he doesn't do it there. And I think that's one of the things when you think about his um, you know his optimal role. Um, you know, how maybe the challenges of projecting that. Like this is the sort of thing as a secondary creator. You know, attacking kind of the, I think the language I try to use when I was writing my notes is like a tilted defense attacker, which is not real off the tongue at all. Um, but there's, I still differentiate that between second side and tilted defense. Um, and I think he can get there to be a really, really useful guy in this situation, but he's still a little slow to capitalize on those, uh, you know, advantages consistently when he does take advantage of them. Um, you really see some interesting things with his physical tools, kind of using his overwhelming frame for a, for a two guard. Um, but yeah, here clearly is, an, is a situation where he, um, the offense presents him an opportunity and he doesn't, doesn't use it. Um, and that's the sort of thing he's going to have to use to really be a useful um, NBA or kind of useful secondary creator in the NBA. Yeah. I mean, to me, the most important thing on this possession, he doesn't get two feet in the paint. And it's partially because he doesn't always do corresponding jabs. Like I love a jab series. I think that it's uh, 
probably like everybody has those vestigial 90s, early 2000 NBA thing they love. Uh, some people love a, you know, a, a back shoulder fadeaway. I'm kind of immune to the charms of that. But for me, it's a jab series. And the thing that bothers me with, with younger guys with jab series, and I think it's just natural from, from the way that like skills training often works, is that they don't always target feet and they don't always like if something works, they don't like a tinker with it. Like you saw him jab twice on that and he didn't get a shift in, in hip level. He didn't get a shift in shoulders mm-hmm. and he didn't get a shift in feet. And so here we're going to watch Karis, somebody who like occasionally does too much with jabs, but always gets, is always targeting the right thing. So here we see, you know, he's getting pushed middle and he's going, he, he has already like kind of done a rip through, comes back, jabs again. Now he's getting pushed middle. That's a full win. It doesn't matter what has happened after this possession. He got the defense to change what they were guarding, which means the backside is now out of position. Mm-hmm. So the defender's going to sell out for some reason to on baseline, which he was not told to do. And Karis gets two in the paint because he changed foot he was able to then use the sand to get two feet in the paint and it's like you can take your time with jabs and kill advantage then you have to regain the same level of advantage that was caused as yeah i mean the thing that stands out there is just you know the, the high hip changes it goes from from right to left um and that's what that's what karis wants and that's that's what jab step should do um whereas as you mentioned you know with christopher it, it almost just seems like he's jabbing for the sake of it because jabbing looks cool um but yeah, I mean, there's just no purpose to it. I mean, the, the whole thing is you want to be economical in your movements. Uh, and Christopher, it, it, that's that's one, I think that is one of his overarching things he has to improve is, you know, he can do a lot of things with the physical tools. Like he could really put some power and force behind that jab step. Um, but he kind of just sit and make, he, he jabs, but he doesn't jab with his whole body, right? Whereas Karis is using his his full body to really attack that defender and make him make him change how he's positioned to defend Karis. Yeah, I mean, I just think that Karis, like, sells his move better. But Karis, like, more importantly, Karis is targeting a specific thing where sometimes, like, I don't want to say that, that Christopher reads like he's not doing it for a reason. But I think that the intent at times is cloudy. Like, he's trying to get a thing, but it's not it's not corresponding. There's not a, 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 a coupling of, like, the perception of what the defense is trying to take away and what he's jabbing. And, like... It's like- it's like he's he's jabbing to create an advantage, but he doesn't know how he's going to create that advantage. Almost is the way I I saw that sequence pre that previous sequence. Like he wants to do something, but he doesn't know how that jab is going to serve a purpose. Whereas Karis does. Yeah, um, I would say like it's a difference between like reach and grasp. Like he can do a lot of these very complicated jabs, moves and he has the craft. But part of of having the craft is knowing when the appropriate tool is. And like he does a rip through move, it's like that was right, and then rip through and go in that circumstance. And other times it's jab, wait a second, and then re jab. But it's only like when that when the time strikes correctly, and he's still learning when when the uh, like when when the appropriate time to use all of his craft, like which I would say is very developed. But you know, like a young painter, still doesn't know when to freestyle and 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 when to to color. You know, like within within the. Um, so mm-hmm. here we're going to, I think, gonna get our first real exposure to, to the half-court defense. Um, Stanford runs a, a really motion-heavy offense. Um, I would say it's like one of the, the more horizontal uh, college offenses. And they're very good at targeting uh, defenders. So they're good at getting who they want on the weak side after, like, sort of clearing out space. So here they kind of they get Christopher as, as the target guy, and they're going to run a pick-and-roll um, after uh, as a response. And you will see how quickly when, like, how quickly his two lateral steps are where he can just reattach. It ends up being a turnover. Like I would say partially just because he grabs the right guy, but like, <laughs> this is the downhill, like aggressive, uh, that coach call it like piranha style, where it's just attack, attack, attack. You have a weak ball handler, overwhelm them. Um, and like, this is the sort of stuff I would want him to do where he's, you know, he's pushing this guy away from the screen. Then he overcomes it and it's reattached. Um, you get the same thing here where it's like, you know, you get a ball handler that you think is the one. So you go after them. And I think that, like, while this isn't an archetype that's super present in the league, like, as the league gets smaller, they're still, you're going to bring bad ball handlers on the court. That's just inevitable. And to have the best version of Josh Christopher as one is, like, if you put a bad ball handler on the floor, he's just like, hey, go pick up, like, three quarters. Make his left hell and bump him. Um, and then this is the off-ball equivalent. Here we have him uh, in space, and he's, he, as we can see, he stabs a little bit here, recovers, and, like, doesn't get burned, which is a, a huge thing. <laughs> Um, and then doesn't reattach correctly, like technically, like he, he reattaches physically well, but not technically well. And it, it allows a window that a different guard gets a straight line because he's yeah. not ordering what he's taking away. It's just a, that aggressive for aggressive, like aggressive for the sake of aggression, because it's valuable. It allows him to take a bad route. And that's, sh- that should have been a layup. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just, it's, it, it's, it's interesting. The contrast here, you see the, 
the recovery in these short areas compared to the you know the the one earlier where he was splitting the difference on the weak side, like he he's able you know he's a little slow reacting to that that screen on the turnover previously, um, but he recovers so quickly that he just gives a little body bump with his strength uh, and you know kind of throws the guy off balance and the ball is you know. You know, sent, sent, he sailed, you know, he pushed the ball, you know, into a turnover, um, and then also, also on that play too, where he's able to, you know, recover and take away the initial back cut. Um, just kind of a stark contrast there um, between kind of the, I guess, the the wide area recovery, um, splitting the difference between shooters versus that that little short area um, quickness. I'm curious, what do you what do you make of that in terms of kind of his physical? tools, what's, what's responsible for his ability to recover so quickly on those two plays versus being a little more, uh, you'd be a little slower to, to recover back to Spencer Jones on that open three earlier. I mean, I think that he's more of like a football athlete where like, uh, it's not quite a phone booth. Like he's, he's explosive in small spaces, but just like that short area, you know, covering five yards as fast as humanly possible. He's very quick, but he just doesn't have like his hips don't open up great. Like he's a good, he's good at exploding as a change of directions, but he's not great at turning. Um, like not, not the same thing as Zion because like Zion is, it turns like a boat, but like, <laughs> like, but a version of that where like he can explode two different directions, but like changing those directions at full speed. Um, so I think that it, it's partially like how his, his body is built. And also that like, he's just not, um, I, I think that he has some flexibility issues uh, in, in like his hamstrings and stuff, a mixture of short legs. Um, to me, it strikes me as fixable, um, just because of like he might be too big. Like now he's not full Pat Will, but like I just think that he might be a little bit stronger than he needs to be in his little body, and that leaning up and and maybe you know doing a little bit more distance running in his life uh, might you know like that sort of like limberness and, and focus on stride length is probably going to serve him better than like a guy who just like needs to do PT. Yeah, I think that's that that Zion parallel is, is great and really articulates the point well because obviously Zion is a guy who can can uh, you know would probably I mean he's not we wouldn't do the same thing as Josh Christopher there, but I could see a very similar situation um between Zion trying to play the weak side and struggling versus Zion maybe covering one guy in a short area. So uh yeah, that, that totally makes sense. I think the football idea is is certainly uh, you know salient. Um but yeah, I was I was just curious because I couldn't quite I didn't know quite what to make of it, but when you gave me the Zion Comp. Obviously, you're not comparing them as players, of course, but I think that certain physical trait um, really does, you know, make sense to me. Yeah. So here we're going to get, uh, I would say, an Arizona State staple. Uh, it's like an, it, I think it's a, a mixture of thumbs. It's an Iverson that has like a thumbs down component for this first lob, um, and they give him him the they give him the ball coming off the, like the the second. They give him give him the ball early and let him navigate the screens. Um, it's a pretty cluttered set in that like he doesn't have like this initial read. There's not that much there. Um, and, and then it's a crack back. The, the two are going to go set a double screen for the point guard coming back. So like he has a window to attack. It's this lane on the slot right here. That's his lane to attack. It's just not particularly like clear. Um, and I think that like, this is where I want to say like, I wanted more targeting reps. Cause like, this is the sort of decisions I don't really want him to make where it's like, okay, don't attack, don't attack stall. Okay. Now you can attack. Like these are, it's sort of a blurry situation. Like he kind of drops that guy and, and is able to get the cap for it game um the thing that i would like to see like more of from him i think i might have yeah i i, I miss what this is. um well we will come back to the section um i thought this was i think the next play give me some small technical difficulties ignore the cool Keldon johnson plays okay so here we have him driving baseline again. Good first step. the The defender doesn't seal the baseline, and so he this this close defender has two people. He has the uh, he has the roller for this like this split second. He has the corner, and Christopher like forces the forces a decision. Um, but it, I think it's really interesting to watch like how the defender's hands move. So like he, you have four hands up, right? <laughs> and as a as a, a creator, your job is to to frame arms to make sure that you have all the passing lanes you want so if you're trying to to throw you know this dump off you want to make sure all the hands are up if you want to fake the lob to get it to the, the shooter in the corner you want them looking down for the bounce pass and i think that this is like this is a difficult craft to ask for uh, you know, an 18 19 year old to do but like especially as a guy who can play at different paces in time and like i think that's one of the things that we were really excited to talk about is that like seeing guys who do know who do have this craft like beal is this, I would say, of like seeing like 
people are like, oh, Beal's going to score. Beal's going to score. And getting into situations where, like, he could force it, he gets a full commitment, and then it's dump off. And these are the areas that, like, going off two feet really helps. Because, like, people just assume that you're always going to power up. And I think that that's something that, like, I would like to see him play with is, like, slowing down on that last step, similar to what we talked about with Jimmy and Kara stuff, is slowing down. Be like, okay, so which pass are you taking? You can't have your arms in all these places. And then it comes to number. Getting a commitment, making the defense make a decision, then punishing them for the decision that you make. Yeah, he, on, that, on that turnover, he rushes into the kind of the double there. Um, and if he, and the, I think it's the footwork that is really the crux of the issue there is that he doesn't really have another choice, right? Like when he gets to that point, he has to, he has to pass. Like he can't just stand there because of the way he kind of dribbles or attacks into that space. Um, like if he slows it down, maybe that, maybe when it's at the E and devils there on the baseline, he's got a much better chance of forcing the defense to do something um, you know, forcing them to commit because then he has, but other will be the reason he has to make that kind of that sloppy behind the back pass kind of on the fly is because of the footwork there. He doesn't have another, you know, the only solution is either to fall out of bounds basically, or get rid of the ball. Um, and I think it really stems from the, the footwork is the, is the end of it, but it's the, it's the pacing again, that you, you mentioned uh, kind of a minute ago, sorry ago, um, that really is the issue, but it is revealed in the, in kind of the, the stride length and the footwork that, um, you know, kind of hinders him on that play and forces him into a difficult decision. Yeah. Um, and here we just get some really fun full court explosiveness. <laughs> Again, shout out to the SVSM uh, pro models. Um, and just a general shout out to, you know, mismatching shoes and uniforms. Uh, we never thought we would see the day. Um, he has, with, with a big, like, if he has a runway, he can really get up. It takes him a second to, to charge up. Like in terms of his gather, like his time from feet touching the ground to, uh, to like peak, he gets up quickly. But the loading element does take him a while, and I think that's what the the bias against two foot jumpers is like. You do need a runway. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a. Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, it's it's a plane, not a helicopter. Um, <laughs> and and so like that can be some of the difficulty in the half court. But like there is, if he does get the footwork down. There is a real way to, um, to to for him to to leverage that in the half court. Um, so here we have a, a shake option. So we're gonna get this drive baseline. His defender turns his head, and his defender does not see him. So now Christopher has an option. The the Bagley in the corner is gonna be getting cut, and so Bagley has the choice to find where the um, where the hardest closeout is. He goes to the baseline. Then you know is that a longer closeout? You know just trying to to read. The, the shape of the defense and move to where the hardest closeout is um, as uh, as the he shakes perfectly and gets to an exact like a, a wide open lane. This is like an ideal shot is getting to a place where um, where the, the pass is clear. Um, next rotation comes quick one one. Um, this is this is like the the encouraging processing recognition stuff where you have three or four like Actions happen, and he quickly, you know, gets to where he needs to be. And then, as a new input comes, the ball comes out. So, like, I think when he's not setting like his idea of a way, when when new things are presented to him, he responds quickly. It's when he has the same old answers that I find to, there to be a problem. Um, For sure, was, I, oh, thing on that. Sorry, the subtle thing on that last one. Uh, I just, I just, it's a very small thing, but I like that he calls for the ball too, and kind of makes it doesn't just call for it, puts his hands up. Um, obviously, that's not the biggest thing there. The thing that stands out is the quick decision to swing the ball. But um, I, I do like that he, he kind of he lifts ever so slightly to that little you know, slot area, uh, you know, and then just makes the pass in the air. But I do like that he makes known that he is he is open there. Yeah, and he doesn't do the clay thing where you point to somebody else so that you can get the ball on the second swing, which is that's the vet move. Um, so here we have one of I would say a thing that like troubled me um, is that like he will get to the he will battle back through a DHO or a screen. He'll get too even, and then he just won't retake it. So, like, here, he's about even. I think I missed, the, like, two frames on this, so he, he's already lost the corner a little bit. And it's like, we're out of the, the slow recovery zone. Now we're into, like, the, into bigger spaces. And he just doesn't have either the gas or um, the, the angle recognition because he wants to attach so bad. And he just gives up these corners when he, like, is seemingly there the whole time. Yeah, and I think on that play, too, what also maybe troubles me is it, it looks like maybe he thinks there's like, he thinks that 24 is going to pick up the switch there, but there's that, I mean, there's, there's Oscar Silva in the middle there. Who's clogging the lane. 
Um, so to me, that kind of maybe maybe that's not what he thinks, but um, he clearly does kind of let up. Uh, and to me, that maybe just shows a little lack of, you know, reading the floor there. Like you've you've got to know you've got. I mean, he's he's been around that area long enough to to know that there's someone in the paint there who might be setting a, a pseudo back screen on on the guy he expects yeah. to switch there. Um, so that that concerned me a little bit too. The the idea that he's expecting a switch, but there's not really the angle for that for that big man to, to pick up the switch. Yeah, I mean, to me, like switches are are you know last minute resources for most teams, and like he could have got that corner. He could have taken the corner back and, and chose not to. I mean, not chose not to, but he failed to. I don't want to make it sound like he quit. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying that there was a moment in, in the moment slipped through his fingers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so here we have another zipper cut, and catch high a pick and roll and this is sort of like there's this wasn't timed perfectly from a team perspective so like ideally you want those actions paired ideally you want it so that as soon as he catches the ball the nick screen comes and and this can't happen which is that like a team basically saying it's an open switch like whichever way you want to go we got somebody (laughs) and like this is a a bad circumstance ideally you just want the big to short roll it that's that's not the, the spacing situation we're in um, but it presents a, a concern of like, so what happens when he is put into to these circumstances and like, he can default into just taking like fine shots. Like, it, you know, it's, a, it's an okay circumstance. The issue is that like when he has to accelerate into jumpers, the balance issue comes out, his legs can tip out and he's going to his right, which we've talked about as like, when you have to shoot across your body, the area that's a concern is shooting, is shooting from your left pocket. If you're moving full speed from your left to right, what's going to happen? Your right leg is going to swing out like a pendulum. And that's exactly what occurs on this possession. So like, I think that because of his specific limitations with his jumper, I'm less happy when he has to create moving to his right. And if I were to guard, if if that were the you know if I were guarding him, I would just be like, oh, it's open switch is going to his right. Like whichever side he picks, just push him right and and sit back. Um, yeah, and I think you know what's interesting too is you mentioned kind of the timing not being great there. I would have loved to see the timing be good there and see how he reacts because yes, ideally. When he comes up from that zipper cut and the man's trailing him ever so slightly, the, the screen's right there so you can widen the advantage rather than kind of resetting the, the play there and almost, to, you know, rather than having it be, you know, one movement to the next, it's kind of one movement altogether that flows, you know, in in concordance or in harmony. Um, but the other thing that stood out to me on that play too is I don't like the jumper itself. Jalen House is on the strong side corner. Jalen House is a good shooter. Um, his his man is, is stunting off pretty aggressively to help on a potential drive. Like there's there's a there's a passing read pretty quickly like like that is open for a long time like when he gets right to the elbow there like just swing that ball I know Jalen House is kind of small but that's an open like it's an open shot for a good shooter I think Jalen House shot like 39 percent I think from three this year um, and so that's the other thing that stood out to me too is is like I like the balance of course on the landing you know I, I resonated but um, the fact that I didn't I didn't even I didn't like the decision to shoot as is um, I didn't like the I didn't like the creation outcome but I didn't like the decision to create for himself rather than make the swing pass there because it is open. Um, it's a pretty simple, pretty simple pass there. I think that, you know, would have benefited the offense more than a, a kind of a contested jumper, as you mentioned in a way that you know, on the right side, that isn't necessarily conducive to his best uh, chances of, of converting. Yeah. I think that I would be fine with the jumper. If you made the, if you made the defender helping off house or more, if he made them scurry back and then took the jumper, I'd be fine. Mm-hmm. Like, because then the process is like, I see you. Think about whether how much you help next time. Because the next time the ball's going to go, you know, instantly out of hands into, you know, out to house. And to me, it's the, like this is a shot he can always get. It's a fine shot, yeah. but the process of getting to that shot wasn't punishing the defense for its choices enough and making it reconsider its options of, of attacking him. So that was my bigger and like those things are all a concern. Like if you take this jumper, fine. But did you make the defense think about the coverage for next time down? Or are they just going to do this exact thing? And to me, that's when you when you have the ability to just like find shots like he's never going to have a problem getting the shot. Um, the, the creation tools are, are, are too good. Um, it's punishing people for how they're defending you for it next time when they're in this. Exact situation. Yeah, he doesn't engage that that strong side defender in the corner where as you know, he, the defender kind of chooses to engage, but he really could have taken advantage of that more than he did. And that, that stood out to me. Yeah. And I will just say this again. I'm probably going to put this clip in every stream. Find an old point guard as soon as you can if you're a young guy coming into the league and just talk to them about navigating screens and just making <laughs> people pay on screens. They are in the league off guile. They're, you know, sticking around basketball because they just understand every time, like you watch Jared Jack or any point guard above, like in the 30s, they are they are getting these angles right. And like 
it, it's just one of those things that will always bug me is when young guards go too soon or too late or just don't punish people with screens. And so that's that's our perfunctory Jared Jack clip for the day. Um, this is going to be the play that I talk about uh, this action. So here we have uh, another one of these like horn sets. Um, this is going to be sort of a decoy action that leads into a flare. And so now we have a, a flare action um, where he is fighting over. Um, and as you can see, his fork is sort of mixed. Like, what do you read this as? Do you read this as he's getting ready to shoot or getting ready to drive? I, I think he's getting ready to drive because if I recall, he's more of a, a hop into a jumper, if I recall. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just based on the fact that one, you know, his right foot is touching the ground ever so slightly, I believe, and his left foot is, is in the air. Um, I read that as a, as a drive, knowing the fact that he's not really a one two step into it guy. But this this play really, uh, I don't know, what, irked me isn't the right, right word, but uh, it eh, irked me is correct, um, because I think he really negated an advantage there. Um, and some of it stems from his preference, his strong preference to go right rather than left. Um, because here, I mean, there he has the physical tools to really explode into all that space. Um, and and he doesn't, if I recall, this ends up being a travel, I think. I don't want to spoil uh, it. Um, this, I, this, I think it's a moving screen on, on the thing. Okay. So to me, this reads as neat. Hmm. And um, we have two different types of clips we're going to talk about on this one. Um, but first, so this is, to me, this is neat. He's not ready to shoot. He's also like not ready to commit to the drive. And when you're running a flare on the side, you know that you have, the, your first thing is seeing like how the, the, defend, the first defender, the one who's fighting over the flare, is covered. If they're if they are like over the screen, it's an attack every time. If they go under, you shoot it. He goes over. There's he has enough space to shoot this. I, I feel like it's not perfectly in a rhythm and his feet aren't set up, so I suggest you not. So now we're one-on-one -on -one with a college big dropping downhill. <laughs> and like to me, the reason that this play jumps out to me is that this is the situation I would draw up for him all day. In the league. This is the ones where I would feel the most comfortable with him. And I feel like he goes away from his strengths into an area to show something. So he's going to catch it, puts the ball on the floor, and he tries to snake it. And, yeah, it is, they do call it a travel. I, I feel like the, the big move, personally. Um, I don't really blame him for, like, the how it happened once he snaked, but I have a problem with the decision to getting to snake. Yes, so, absolutely. I, that's that's my – I feel the same way. I don't, I don't think he needed the snake there. I think he had a pretty clear runway to attack that left side and make yeah. make something happen, and he was a little slow to, to do so. So let's talk a little bit about attacking – so, in these circumstances, coming off two, the real benefit off two is you are hyper stable in air, which allows you to launch at base. You can just go find their waistline and say, I dare you to test verticality because bigs are taught to go backwards. If you get contact, if your arms go forward, it's a foul. And so you can basically throw yourself at a big if you've targeted their hip line correctly, and you can maneuver in midair and they cannot. And if you have the course to build, is that better than probably any any premier player in the NBA? And also the way he loads off too and eats up space with with strength and explosion is is pretty phenomenal. Yeah, and it's the way that the NBA rule book is written. If you can do this, you basically have an advantage. <laughs> and so the thing is, like when I see the way that Josh Christopher is, um, when I see like the way that he's wired, and also like how we've seen him jump. To me, this is the circumstance where I'm like. Yep, this is what I want. This is where I can get him jumping into a college big who will not maintain verticality. He's proven that he can target contact. I don't feel like he's not like phenomenal with, with crafting it, so it's an automatic foul. And there's a lot of ways of doing this. Like here we see Ant doing roughly the same thing. I mean, Ant and and, um, and, and Jacob are built sort of the same in terms of like the, the body and how shoulder heavy they are. And like, look, Ant is falling down with the ball basically beneath his right shoulder, and he's still core stable. He's, mm -hmm. he's falling over, but his core is still strong enough that he can get there. And that's a NBA defender that he's jumping into. And it's even with NBA rules, like that's still not a situation where like bigs are taught to always move back. And so the offensive player has the right to that space in a way that like is truly unfair under the rules. And so when I see this situation from him, I see like, look, you we found a loophole in the system. It's time for you to mash the gas and do what you do. Yeah. Uh, how... What do you make of that in terms of improvement? Do you think that's a fairly easily correctable thing in the right system? Or like, because I, I agree that like he, like getting him downhill in those flares and whatnot, or, you know, on cuts uh, and using his strength and the benefits of the rules uh, should be a, a clear strength of his. Um, but obviously, as you mentioned, as we've talked about, he's not always decisive to take advantage of those, those openings. But do you think that's something that 
could pretty easily, you know, be taught in the right, right setting. How do you interpret that for him as a, as a prospect currently? Um, yeah, I, I think that it's more about um, his uh, just changing the mindset of being like, hey, this isn't, we're not going to allow this. Like, if you do this, like, we have a problem. And just being like, this is the read. Like, we will tell you when you could not make the read. That's the benefit of being a rookie is you can kind of put blinders on them and be like, hey, make this read until you've proven you can make this other read. And, uh, and then, you know, we do otherwise. Like, he has this, this like, very high level of, ball, uh, of body control. It really allows him to get to pretty insane things. So like that, that little spin move shouldn't be possible. And he's able to get to a, a reasonable shot because of it. And so it's like, okay, let's all, let's put all of our eggs in that basket at that moment. And then as teams, you know, worry about that aggression, then you can go to the snake. Um, here's where I really like um, his ability to, to read multiple defenders. So here we have, um, uh, we have, you know, a, a pick and roll. They're both showing on him and he's just reading the top side defender. Um, where he, like, if this help defender steps up, then ball goes over the top, they, you know, stick, then he goes to the pop, he makes the right read, and I feel like this is the example of, of the guy that, that we've been asking about, is that he holds the defenders in the spot to make them make a decision. This is, this is the proof of concept that we're not, like, asking for too much, or, or like, this is why he's, to me, a first-round guy, is, like, because that, that moment, that process, that drawing the defenders away from the rim to force the, the help defender to make the read. Yeah, uh, and I apologize, everyone. No, Milo no took exception to that uh, that play for some reason. Uh, maybe she's a Stanford fan. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that 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 that's the sort of thing that yeah that we were alluding to much earlier. That he has like we're not again we're not asking too much. I'm like he's shown an ability to control a defense with 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 a certain cadence and control uh, control a defense with a certain control. My goodness, am I right or not? Um, <laughs> But they, yeah, there's a cadence there that he flashes and exhibits that I think should be encouraging, you know, from a baseline perspective. Uh, and as you can see there, yeah, it really does. You know, they don't score anything on that play, but there's a there's a benefit there because you, you do something, you get the defense into some sort of shift, and that is kind of the the basis of offense is making the defense shift in a way that you prefer. Speaking of shifts, here Stanford does roughly the exact same thing. They put him in the shift. They put him in 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 you know the crosshairs and say, all right, make a decision. We got a pick and roll. His man's clearing out. He's the tagger because of, of the, the very well way or way that this, this play is well crafted. Um, he's able to come in and get a strip, which is, again, quick hands, uh, small area quickness, the stuff that we've seen him from consistently at this moment. But here's a moment where, like, this is his tag, this is his tag, he needs to be down. It, it's, it's blurred for that moment. And if there's one thing that uh, I, I would say, like, the coaches of the NBA and, like, you know, uh, basketball in general are good at is just blurring tags to be like, all right, so what are you going to do? Here's an uphill tag from, from UCLA Gonzaga, a team that you're uh, very familiar with it, where they put the point guard in the same spot and be like, okay, choose between a lob and a three. Oh, you chose wrong punish. Next, yeah. We have uh, another, another team um, and a, uh, a, a, some people would say cover boy of a magazine uh, for a story written by a person. Um, <laughs> no one really yeah. knows. Uh, oh. I was going to say the Suns are are magnificent at, at really compromising the low man's responsibilities there. Um, but here we have them on defense with Cal Bridges in a very difficult, I mean, almost exactly the same situation in terms of where the, the mechanics of the floor are, but not produced differently. So Cal Hodges has this tag, and he has this tag on a side pick and roll where the window is super tiny. So he has to go from the top of the key all the way over basically to the baseline to prevent this lob to a big. And those are just the expectations. Like the NBA is very good at, at making defenders have to doubt themselves. Like, do I really have the top of the key and the baseline at the same time in this pick and roll possession? The answer is yes. And while we may have concerns about his ability to to cover big space, these are certain certain circumstances where if he does like his explosion when he's at that spot will be meaningful because if it's a drop off to the big, he can meet a big, big at the rim with no problem. Mm -hmm. On so you know. Comparing that to the earlier play when you said it was kind of a, a like it's only it's an elite it's an elite play that a guy makes splitting the difference there properly. How do you weigh this? Because I mean, it, I mean it is that is a tough play for him to navigate because Spencer Jones is a good shooter. He is locating to the corner. Um, like is that is that a play that you're more you you expect more of him there? Like you like right there you expect him to shift down into the restricted area and make the tag. Like how uh, do you? This is a team communication issue. So like right okay. now, this is the responsibility of, of the low man saying, like, I'm being moved, I'm being moved and letting him know. I mean, like similar to exit, it's not about 
the defender's ability. It's about the defense's ability to communicate what the offense is doing. So if you don't communicate, that's the purpose of this, is to target two defenders who are not explaining whose attack responsibility it is. And if you don't communicate in this moment that I've frozen in, it's going to be a layup for somebody. Mm-hmm. And okay. so, so like, I, I don't, th- I think this is the sign of like an elite defense covers this every time, but it's not about can an elite defender be there? It's can you do the, the soft skills of defense, which are positioning and, and uh, communication, you know, not just in, in your moments, but in moments that lead to your moments. And mm-hmm. that's the difference between like, you know, the, like what, what Tiger gets put in here is that's him alone. But what Mikhail gets put in is like understanding that the corner has to communicate with the top and say like, I'm not tagged, even though you'd always think, oh, low man's tagged, but you don't help off strong side corner. So again, mm-hmm. there's two rules of basketball happening and those two people need to essentially have a philosophical conversation about defense while this pick and roll happens. So like, mm-hmm. is that an elite skill? Yeah, but it's also like what's required on a, on a possession by possession basis in the NBA. Um, here's some of the physical limitations. Like again, every athlete is different. And here uh, he's going to get, uh, he's going to show a little too high on the screen yep. to try to prevent it. And he has to jump off one. And off one, he's like, okay. But he's not uh, very, like he's not putting his elbow in the rim. Like he was off two. Yeah. And he's just a, a less, he's a more susceptible athlete off one to, to strength. He's just not as, as, um, as stable and not as comfortable. Um, which means that like when he has these pressure situations, he really has to battle to get in front because he can't quite get those, those one foot contests in the same way. Yeah. The, the, especially positioning there, uh, <laughs> positioning both in terms of, uh, how, how upright he was and how high he was playing on that left hip, uh, of his defenders to that. Yeah. The, obviously the lack of explosion off of one foot plus the new, the new shoes after halftime. Yeah. Um, I cannot spot ID what these are. I think they're a pair of uh, Harden four. I think they might be Harden four PEs. Um, but he's he's gone deep into the Adidas bag. To really yeah, see. Absolutely is. These might be a pair of Dame twos. Looking at the sole unit. So here we do get a, a proper jab. So like here, the defense is about like if you need to target that top. He's fully horizontal, ninety degrees. He gets a foot drop. Jumper goes up. Perfect decision. Like mm-hmm. here, he targets the foot successfully. He un- like he it's it's a it's a well balanced move. He gets you know multiple layers of, of reaction. You know, shoulder move, hip move, the, the defender's feet move, and it results in in a wide open jumper. Which for him, like considering that he has a jumper that takes a little bit of time to get off, is is a meaningful amount of space. Mm-hmm. Catch and shoot. We see the the left shoulder. This one's short. Again, I this one I think you can pretty clearly see that he shoots it off his uh off his pinky. Um, which is like I think the reason why there's power generation issues is because we talked about like the engineering formula. You lose a little bit of power, and when you're shooting a ball, you know, 26 feet into you know a two foot diameter, like every little tiny percentage is is a meaningful one. Uh, here we have you know a a, a Miami so DHO into um, into a pick and roll, and we will get back to screen craft, um, and um, and he just allows an under. This can't happen, especially if you're a guy who wants to live at the rim. Every every pick and roll decision has to be punished. He pulls it out um, to to go, uh, you know, one four flat, and we get a, a circumstance that that happens a lot where he's driving into a set fully set defense. Mm-hmm. And he's but the point of attack defender is is right on his hip, so he's in a circumstance where, um, where he himself like he has advantage, but the team doesn't. And this is still an opportunity to create. It's just that you have to use, like, it's not going full speed. It's using the strength against the defense. So, like, yeah. The thing that stand out to me there, one is the, in, the not the, I guess, the lack of turning the corner on that initial kind of pick and roll going to the right. And then two, right there, like, maybe a little, maybe a little earlier, like, I don't want to compare him to Giannis, of course, but Giannis is making that pass to, Mar- to Marcus Bagley. Like, Giannis is really good. At, like, he's not a great passer, but he's really good at knowing when the defense is keyed on him. Mm-hmm. And he's right. That pass it's a little. It's a little tougher because he's much smaller than Giannis. But I think he can make that one more dribble. Can maybe get to right before the left elbow, and then because I mean, he's, I mean, Bagley's open kind of the entire play there. I mean, that's why Christopher draws a charge. You know, it's called for a charge. Like I think that's an important read too. Is one the fact that he doesn't turn the corner going right when he has a chance to, with kind of his power and whatnot. Uh, and two, he misses the read there. Um, again, when there's, I mean, literally all all ten guys, all five guys looking at him, and there's a there's a good shooter in the you know in the Strong corner. I mean, it's a tough read from there, but technically still a strong corner. 
So I wanted to pitch a different solution to this problem. So say he makes the same decisions, but he's in this circumstance where he has a half step. Mm -hmm. And what he needs to do is simply like cause a rotation by beating his man. And a lot of ways to do that is with stride stops. So instead of going full speed, you have two options. One would say like is a, a strong euro. So this is where you we have Keldon versus Tillman. And you're going to see Keldon make contact with his left shoulder and then replace going across with his right. So leading, leading Tillman toward, you know, to, towards the paint and then simply swapping shoulders to, on his second step. So create the contact with a quarter step. Again, it's a pretty similar situation. Mm -hmm. First shoulder. And then he's going to replace with the second shoulder as he takes that second step. Creating a basically a moment where, you know, it's a, a small touch of the brakes. Tillman's going to fly by, and you have enough for, for an extension. You don't have a second defender over top, but it's the same idea of if you beat the one, then the drop off is much easier because then you're going to get the rotation, not just a guy dropping with no responsibility. Um, I think that's. I think the fact that there are multiple, I mean, basically three different ways that he could have benefited from that that is within his wheelhouse is encouraging i think from a de developmental standpoint because you have a lot of the physical tools right he could have he could have turned the corner going right would have been a little tougher like because they went under but he could have probably done it he could have you know made the pass to the corner he could have you know done the the deceleration and, kind of, and then using his frame for kind of get the kind of tip and i think that's encouraging from a developmental standpoint the fact that there are three different ways he could have gone, gone about capitalizing on an advantage um but at the same time it also necess necessitates developing those things what if i told you there's another now we have the stride stop <laughs> so let's we'll talk about four different solutions. So now we have Maxi, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, pretty set defense. There's a little bit of help, but like they're, they're mostly minding their business. Um, he goes by and same half step. He uses the, the defender to simply stop. He goes uh, inside, outside stride stop. Uh, I think we have a couple other options. Um, it, it's more about how you find balance. So you create, you create that contact the same way that, um, uh, that Keldon did. But mm -hmm. instead of you create that contact and then immediately hit the the e-brake let them fly by and you have an opportunity for an up and under or a back shoulder spin and so like th in this situation if you know what we what we saw from from uh josh had hit the e-brake this exact same footwork combination it allows the next defender to have to step up and we have done and this is like a, a staple for like big strong guys i mean jalen brunson hits you with this you know a million times a game luke will hit you this a million times a game um here we have Karis, exact same moveset. I believe he inverts it, so if he's outside in, into, into reverse. It's taking t people who want to be physical when you have a half step and simply going by them. And this is a solution that I would have been excited to see more of him because he does have, I've seen him do this exact moveset. I've seen him have this craft, but using it to set up the playmaking when there are two defenders guarding you and you have to just beat one to force another rotation, something I would have been interested in. Yeah, I think the the charge there is it harkens back to the the lack of you know, the, the lack of pacing at, at times in the footwork. Like going back to that uh, that turnover that behind the back pass in the first half. Um, similar idea, right? Where he 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 doesn't uh, the process to drive or attack is is flawed, and so he gets into a place where his footwork can't allow him to make the optimal decision because of the fact that he went about it at a cadence that wasn't ideal. That's exactly what happens here. He drives he drives the middle. Uh, or there's a middle drive and he shakes. I, f I really like his shakes. And then he's suddenly super wide. And instead of going, you know, either sidestepping for three, he bananas this out into traffic and has to make a tough decision. Like, is this the wrong choice? No, you're, you're making you're but you're in that moment where you don't have great options because of the, the footwork limitations and, and some of the shot, like I would say difficult decisions, putting yourself in harder situations than you have to be. Or like this could have just been sidestep three, could have been sidestep pull up. Like we have options, then he just keeps pushing it into a into a tougher and tougher place. Yeah, and I think I think you kind of use the, the bananas term, and it's but uh, you can eat bananas around it. But he's he's too I think too often he's east west with his movement patterns mm -hmm. when he when he has he, he can be I mean he can be really I mean he can be really forceful and overwhelming going north south, and he should be because of the frame and and some of the explosion um, and the ability to kind of eat up space with the two foot leaping. Um, but he just hasn't quite gotten there. But I think, but I personally think it's something that you can can be alleviated or you know corrected. I think it's you know it's just one of those things where you watch more film and you show him that play and you show you say you should have attacked down. You could you know, straight line attack into the middle there rather than you know two extra steps to your left and then attacking and, and eventually you kind of rep that rep that down and you make that improvement over time. Yeah, and here we see that 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 he can be good laterally. Like here, you'd say what I would say is a great two steps to event like to. When this swing happened from, from corner to slot, I thought he was giving up this paint touch. And he flattens this out 
something crazy. And I'm just like, okay, there is like there is this like defensive slide here that that is really inspiring. Um, but it's it's again just like working on on getting that craft down and not asking him to do uh, these difficult things. Here we here we have uh, I think a, a move that you alluded to earlier catches it off an Iverson, and instead of pivoting um, out to to direct the defender away from a screen he knows is coming. He reverse pivots towards. So instead of presenting the option of going to flat towards that baseline, he pivots uh, out, giving them like, hey, we're running a pick and roll. They run again, pick and roll into double stagger. And there's a moment of just lost advantage. Turns out well, but the, the design for the play doesn't reach its, its intended moment of putting pressure on one side, then attacking middle, then bringing pressure back to the second side. Instead, it's just because there's a blow by that this way. It's not by his own intention. Um, to, to show a an example, um, we have two of like basically the exact same plays, and watch how it's the it's the same move, but it's a switched foot to send a different level of pressure. Beal is going to pivot out, sending uh, I think this is Royce O'Neal that way, so that way when the chasing pick and roll comes, it's set up in the way that he wants, and the defender is way out of position, and now we can run a tight pick. And that's the level. That's the difference in craft is that choosing which foot to pivot with. Sets up that pick and roll. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean that. I mean just the just how quickly Beal changes directions there uh, and really sets up the. I mean just. I mean Beal's ankle flexibility is really ridiculous. Yeah. Um, but you, you, yeah, just the ability to create those little openings with footwork is something that I, I think that you know you see a guy like Beal use really well. But I think you can also there's there's an area for uh, there's room for for Christopher to use that in due time. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, and then the last one, I, I feel like it would be wrong to to not include it. Is basically the same moment from Devin Booker to show the um, the exact same circumstance of the scoring situation. So he's going to come off uh, another. Uh, I think it's an Iverson um, into open space. Exact same footwork inside inside reverse pivot. Whereas Beal went out, or whereas um, uh, uh, Josh went outside reverse pivot, and that is the amount of separation. And you, it may not lead to like a wide open look, but just that step really puts a pressure on a defense so that ne- like even if you don't get it the first time you're setting up the next time where now you can counter into the pick now you can counter into the blow by and i think that's a theme that that layering of of footwork is that like doing it a certain way sets up those counters for next time and now defenses have that element of like what am i going to do yeah and i think when you're applying that to christopher you mentioned kind of needing a little more space because they release that's the sort of thing he can create with his footwork but he's going to need the space because of the release there too, you know. Obviously, if you you just translate in the Booker play specifically, obviously he he'll probably. I mean, ideally you'd want him driving rather than settling for that mid range jumper, um, because with Booker it's not settling because he's a great mid range shooter. Um, but yeah, the creation of space for for shooting uh, with the footwork and and whatnot, I think is really important for him off the ball, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and then just watch how far he shakes on this. <laughs> just shakes all, all, basically all, all the way around the world. Um, uh, that is our last up. I just wanted to jump back to this before we, we head out of here. Um, is Oh, yeah, this is real quick. So I talked about like what happens when you're not set up for a pass or a shot. And that like there are four configurations that I would really be excited to to see Christopher get. Um, and the first one is is what I would consider like a split foot catch. Or you're truly you're never considering shooting. So here we're going to see Keldon catch off ball, and that's kind of favorite thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's not. Uh, there's a second variety of this that, that we're going to is that he's catching ready to go, and so that way this if this defender doesn't take a great angle to just like if they close out to him like he's going to shoot, he has a lane. And if if they close out super hard, he can always put it back. And so it's requiring an adjustment to the defense because you know that like this isn't the shot you want. You know you have an angle. And it's recognizing that, like, instead of letting the defense determine things, it's just like, oh, you're going to close on me like a shooter. I'm just going to stampede to the rim. And the second one is a go and catch, where you, instead of catching it split foot, you just start running and then go get the ball afterwards. I and, love that. Kelden so does that a lot, and I love, I love it when he does yeah. that. And it's just a way of putting extra pressure on the rim when there's not a close back. So instead of catching it and being like, oh, am I going to shoot this? I'm wide open. It's just being like, oh, no, the scariest thing in the world is me with a full head of steam. And again, we see the Kelvin with the uh, the uh, with this body type is all core stability. So we see him go and catch. He knows he's he's already started running before the ball is even there, and allows him to get that. And I think these are elements with Christopher that I think he worries about, like the 
perception that he can't shoot and wanting to like validate that with jabs instead of being like, that's fine. You think I can't shoot? I'm going to get 15 free throws in this game. And that like the jumper, that'll make his jumper easier. And I think making these sort of footwork possibilities an option for him is a big deal. So um, just, just to wrap up, shot mechanics, any, any final thoughts on that? Uh, no, I think the one thing I mentioned in, in passing is I do like uh, the, the hop, especially because I think he's going to be, because I, I project him more as an off-ball scorer. We didn't mention a ton of, them in, a ton of the off-ball stuff, but it was, it, was tough to, it was tough for it to really be available because of the myopic tendencies of Arizona State's offense and you know, decision makers. Um, but I think that, you know, the fact that he hops, I think, is useful, especially because he has a little long, long, elongated release. I think that, you know, I think you talked about it with, with the Roko stream uh, a while ago that, you know, it's, it's use, it's, there's not really a, a benefit versus one versus two or one, one, one to two versus hop. But I think in terms of kind of streamlining the release or the, the, pro, the release speed, excuse me, it helps with a guy like Christopher who has a little bit, takes a little longer to get the ball out of his hands. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's, you know, there's strengths and weaknesses to each one. I think for guys who maybe struggle with the rhythm a little bit more, it wasn't like a game where he really, he knocked down threes in this one, but in games where he does struggle with his rhythm, the hop can be good to establish it. Um, mm-hmm. I think that, you know, you pointed out that this is a game where momentum was harder for him to find and that he has to, you know, maybe work on engineering that a little bit more with how people close out on him. Um, do you think like long-term he's, he's a reasonable bet to shoot? I think, I think so. I, I think especially when you showed that, you know, that work that, the work he's done to remove the thumbing that works against, you know, his, his release. I think that's really encouraging, but I think he'll be, I think he will reach a point, both volume and efficiency wise that should open some driving lanes because teams will need to, to guard him. And that's really all you need given how explosive he can be downhill and some of the low hanging, not, I don't know about low hanging, but the, the areas for attainable improvement um, with a footwork that you show with a guy like Keldon, who, um, you know, Keldon is not much of a, I mean, he got better as the year went on, but he's not much of a shooter, but he's, he's, got the big frame and the explosion to get downhill. Maybe not so much the explosion, but the core stability, as you said. Um, I think he'll Christopher will reach that point to where teams at least have to worry about his shooting as a, as a spot-up guy, um, and that will really kind of allow him to attack downhill and, and leverage his his, str- his core strength and his explosion. Okay. And uh, um, thoughts on any takeaways from his defensive archetype? You talked about his sort of like havoc tendencies in big space. Um, is there a type of guy you feel most comfortable with him guarding? I think it would, I think it would kind of probably be one of those those strength based creators who kind of maybe lack lack the burst and like an ideal jumper, like not Jimmy Butler specifically, but that sort of guy who you know isn't really a threat to shoot off the dribble from more than you know 14 feet out, um, and really kind of likes to use his strength as a as a means of advantage creation, um, because Christopher has the strength and some of the lot the short area quickness as we saw. Um, to compensate with that, and also he has the, the the instincts with the hands and whatnot to maybe you know close off some passing lanes and maybe some some tricks where guys try to you know use pivots or up and unders and things. So that would be kind of the archetype I think is best for him. Kind of the Matt using the guys who have similar physical tools to him, um, and maybe lack the ideal pull up jumper or maybe even a baseline of really pull really real pull up gravity. I think it's still largely a work in progress. Um, I, I think he, as I mentioned, kind of as we kicked things off, I think he, he, what's the phrase? And he likes to, again, he likes, he has a preference for doing things on his terms. And while that is okay at times, I think he leans into it too much and mitigates some advantages. But at the same time, I think he's shown an ability to create advantages that aren't initially there when he catches the ball, but I think the advantage care has a long way to go. Um, but I do think he can get there because you see flashes of that recognition. And that's kind of what you want to see, especially for where we're, you know, we're talking about drafting him as a you know, late first, early second guy. Um, so definitely a work in progress, but I think there's enough of a baseline there in conjunction with the ability to create advantages that aren't always you know available upon the initial catch. Uh, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at Jack Frank underscore JJF. Everywhere that I write and talk about basketball is listed in my bio there. Um, that's the easiest way to you know find me. Uh, appreciate you having me on here. Uh, it was really fun, um, really cool to kind of watch a game like this um, be involved. So I appreciate the opportunity to do so, and I hope I was insightful for everyone who uh, everyone who tuned into the the stream today.
Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to take a uh, a, a quick uh, water break, and I'll be back with, uh, uh, with Q&A. Um, I will see you guys in about two minutes. Thank you so much. Thanks, Petey. And we're back. Um, I want to say thank you to uh, Jackson Frank for joining us. Um, any questions that people may have, um, lob them in now. Um, let me quickly send out a tweet, and um, and we can get to it. Appreciate everybody for their questions. All right. Francis asks, did you get a chance to watch Josh and the Combine scrimmages? If so, did those performance indicates any changes at all to his, uh, any changes at all to his approach for you? Um, so I watched a little bit of the Combine scrimmages. I had it on um, and did some background noise while I was doing video editing and, and a little bit of writing. Um, I struggle with scrimmages because for many players, the questions that I have about their game are not um, are not being presented in a scrimmage setting. So, like, there's a very rare type of player. Um, I think EJ Ono is, is a good example of this, where you're just trying to see how they react to a talent level or, or a type of guy. But often, you know, a, a player's bigger issues are like, how do they read a skip pass um, when they are facing a, uh, you know, a, a fuzzy weak side? Um, and that's just not going to happen in a scrimmage. Um, so I think for me, the biggest thing is just making the, the small changes to his jumper with the thumb, seeing that you know, that's that's fixable. I think the left-right motion is a, is a bigger task and generally doing upper body, like jumper surgery during a, a pre-draft is a, a dangerous game to play. Uh, make him look good or it could really damage things. Um, so I think that the biggest takeaway is just the mentality of improvement, which is, you know, like Josh uh, Josh's mentality. Uh, Thank you, slightly sleepy and um, and Angel Boulevard for following. Um, I think for me, the thing is just understanding the improvements that he needs to make and and, and start to go toward down that pathway. Everything else is sort of uh, with his particular style of game um, isn't really going to be informed by a combine for me. Um, Max Goodlove asks, uh, which is a better value to you, Christopher at twenty two to twenty eight or Boat Knight at seven to thirteen? Um, Man, does it depend on on the team? 
Um, I feel like Boat Knight may have been the most damaged by the particular lottery order, uh, where like he probably too many teams has a value in like seven to ten, but the draft order didn't really work out in a way that like those spots are either like for him or the teams who got those spots are uh, going to have those picks when um, when the draft rolls around. So I think that Boat Knight at like the, the lower end of, of like if a team is, is accepting some of those two you know, two for one pick trades. Um, Boat Knight is a pretty good value, but like you'd need a, a with Christopher, I think that on a better team, you know, you can follow the Kelton model where he can, um, he can develop some of the G League, he can play a, a specific role, and that will probably allow him to, to develop in a more targeted way. Um, where Boat Knight uh, is, is sort of required to plug and play and needs a, uh, a fit that, that wants an amount of ball handling, but also not a ton. Um, it's, it, they're both interesting fits. I think that Josh's fits are more voluminous, if that makes sense. Um, but Boat Knight is probably still. Uh, can you talk about Bones? Or Sawyer asks, can you talk about Bones Highland's performance in the Combine scrimmage? Um, yeah, if you wanted the easiest money in the world, you should have laid money on Bones Highland land base scrimmage. Um, Bones was always going to do well in a scrimmage um, because, like, his his game almost more than anybody else's uh, is suited to that environment and the ability to get shots off uh, and and not have uh, like multiple lines of help side defense uh, there to prevent him from getting to the cup. Um, yeah, that was always going to happen. Um, the the people who are saying like, "Oh, is he a first rounder now?" It's like, well, he was a first rounder before. It's just louder now. Um, a lot of people are. Outing that they may not have watched as much Bones Highland as they need to, but yet the stat profile and the uh, the game tape is really wild. Um, Bones Highland fan club lifetime member, larger boy. Um, how fixable is uh, uh, Effalant forty eight asks? How fixable is the left to right motion on his shot, and how important it is, it, if at all, is that for his offensive development? Um, I'll say the second part first. I think that um, it is essential to his development to either move the uh the gather location or speed up the jumper to the point that the gather doesn't um is is less like meaningful like you can you can have a jumper with some weird directions like kevin martin but kevin martin shot very well so the challenge is which one is going to be easier you know, on a short-term basis getting him to shoot faster or getting him to shoot um shoot like in a clean direction from the right hand shooting pocket i would say the answer is, is probably shooting pocket i think that it's probably two summers uh to get to reasonable performance but like it's not i'm not gonna tell you it's easy um jumper drastic jumper changes are never easy um it's not the most difficult as far as prospects go it's just reps and reps and reps and reps and reps of gathering from a different spot um but it's going to be difficult for him to shoot you know, going right on balance with the way that he's currently aligned. And if his value as a, is a shot creator, not just as a guy who has a ton of rim gravity, uh, it's pretty essential for his long-term, um, for his long-term uh, development. Um, thank you, Slightly Sleepy, for following. Uh, Francis asks, do you think Josh would have been particularly better off developmental-wise if he had joined Jalen Green at Ignite? Um, and this is the universe where everybody is still on Ignite. I would say no, because like there isn't a great place for players who are physically overwhelming, um, and, and like especially strong to develop that isn't like a like it's just a it is a trial and error based system. And I think that if the shooting the shooting troubles were always going to be present and then going to damage his stock somewhat. So more than anything for me, I think that like I, I talk about this in, in the piece on Dacian that uh, will be out tonight, um, that like this was probably a year that hurts his stock short term, but helps his development long term, where like it just revealed the the immediacy of which some of the issues need to be dealt with. And like that's not particularly pleasant, but it is um, going to serve long term advantage. Um, so, uh, I always say like second contract money is way more important than first contract money. And there is many a story of a player who had a rough, 
uh, pre-draft year, realized what you know the the issues that needed work to, working on were, had a team understand those issues, and then bloomed into a better player than a guy who did well enough that the there was a misunderstanding about their game and it caused them to probably get overdrafted and to some in some cases slam out of the league because there was a misunderstanding about the topography of their game. Uh, so in in long, the answer is is not quite. Um, Ray says, I did not realize that Bones was plus 70. Yeah, Bones is, uh, Bones is like one of those guys where like he's so skinny that you sort of like, oh, he's not that long. Um, and I think some of it's the, the, the like stocks aren't awesome. But yeah, um, I don't know if anybody had a better combine than Bones because he played in a place that was a little bit off the, the hype radar, like I mean, obviously draft people know him, but um, I, I think the reality of what he is set in for like the general draft industry and and the league at large, um, and having a big old wingspan is a is a huge part of that. Um, Francis says, "How viable do you believe Josh playing as a nominal four would be in many lineups?" I mean, that's what I would recommend in the G League, or you know, I, I'm going to assume that he plays you know at least some of next year in the G League, and like. Playing Keldon at the four really helped him. And I think that it also playing at a four at, at, as a four in the G League is going to really like make those pass shoot decisions really easier. Because like not every four in uh in a developmental league is going to have the physicality to deal with him. So it's just it's going to be more clear. Um, and I think that that's something, you know, as a team really sets out on building a playbook, um, around him in that setting, like it, to me, that's sort of like the ideal, Hey, this is where we want you to attack. Hey, this is where we don't want you to attack, um, type of circumstance would be. Got a couple more before we head on out of here. Um, I will say that I think the I would have been really interested in like seeing. I think of everybody who played a smaller year, he's the guy I'm more. He was the guy I wish that I played a full. I had played every single game of the year um, more than more than Bagley, more than Jalen Johnson. Um, that is, I think that there's like, you know, it's usually pretty easy to delineate. Like, like with Jalen Johnson, you have a certain type of game that he's going to perform well in. You have a certain type of opponent that that was clearly more of a physical struggle for him. Um, and then, like there's sort of a midline where you're like, okay, this is the average game. It was really hard to find that with Christopher. Um, I went through, I think with him, it was harder to find for him what like an average and representative game was than any other prospect. Um, granted, we have you know less than any other prospect that we've had. I mean, like with Garuba, he's played like 90 games this year. So it was pretty easy to find a, a median. Um, but with um, with Josh, that was much harder. And, and I definitely struggled with that. Um, Ray asks, do you have a prediction when Suns Clippers real start time would be? Um, give me 9.22 Eastern Standard Time. I'm going 22 minutes late. Um, Francis asks, what odds would you put on Dior being a better NBA player than Jacob? I don't know. That's There's so many twists and turns possible in, in, in both of their stories that that's a, that's a tough one to call. Um, All right, I think we've got time for one more. If anybody has a uh, a developmental or anything else, we can finish out on that. Um, we do have uh, we do have playoffs that I have uh, you know not counter programmed against today. So. Uh, yeah, we'll finish out on 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 uh, Avalon Forty Eight's question. Um, 
how does him being a two foot Libra li limit his finishing slash interior play? Um, so I think that the biggest limitation is getting two finishes for most two foot leapers. Um, they, they can struggle to find consistent runaways. Um, he's has this mitigated somewhat by, um, by being strong and he's able to just get two finishes. I mean, I think that it helps him more than it hurts him because he's capable of, of having the high level core stability and, and seeking contact and then finishing, you know, once the contact has subsided, um, in a way that is, uh, extremely interesting. It's just getting the, the footwork down, the mentality and the angle work down that are probably the biggest longer term solutions or, or, difficulties for him um and that's all made easier if he's played as you know a, a jet sweep type of guy a, a spacing four who can attack downhill similar to the Keldon clips we showed it's also made it easier if he can shoot um so the answer is that like it's interrelated with many other issues but i think that being a two-foot leaper helps him more than it hurts him all right well um i'm gonna gonna head out um Monday. Um still waiting on a time. I'm gonna confirm with Ricky. We have the uh Evan Mobley stream. And I am extraordinarily excited for it. Um I think it might be like the technically best one that I've done. Um and yeah, I'm really thrilled. I hope that everybody in here is able to make it to the Mobley stream. Um hope to see you guys Monday night. Um I will Hopefully have a time a little later on today. Have a wonderful night and uh, enjoy um, Sun Clippers. See ya.